Motivation is this fleeting feeling and sometimes it comes and sometimes it doesn't. But the good news about the neuroscience is you don't need to feel motivated. You don't need to feel anything to start to change everything. Welcome to the Minimal Mom Podcast. Dawn reaches a million women each month with practical tips to simplify your home. Today, Dawn is joined by Britt Frank, a licensed neuropsychotherapist and author of The Science of Stuck. Britt received her undergraduate degree from Duke University and her master's degree from the University of Kansas, where she later became an award-winning adjunct instructor. Britt is a contributing writer to Psychology Today, and her work has been featured in Forbes, NPR, Fast Company, Psych Central, Self, and Thrive Global. Well, Britt, I have been reading your book, The Science of Stuck. It is, I was pleasantly surprised how fun it was to read. Like you have a great personality. Sometimes you think books like this are going to be a little bit dry, maybe. It's been really enjoyable. So uh, for our friends who are just meeting you for the first time, can you tell us a little bit about The Science of Stuck and where the idea for this book came from? That's so funny. That's the best compliment I could get on a self-help book about like anxiety and stress. It's so much fun to read. I did that intentionally. So yeah. hi, everybody. I'm Britt. I'm a licensed psychotherapist. So I wrote The Science of Stuck mostly because, I mean, I wanted to write a book. That's never not been a thing. But I wrote this one because this one is the one I needed way back in the day when I started yeah. because life's not easy, but some of the information actually is and i was <laughs> horrified that it was like on the dusty shelves of academia buried mm -hmm. in clinical language and it's like no, no no like we can talk like real people because mm -hmm. this is really useful stuff so it's sort yeah. of my love letter to all of the things that i've ever tried done read yes. invented etc and you know for me those things worked and hopefully it'll work for other people too so how would you define being stuck for those who are listening yeah. And it's so important, especially in this like Instagram, everyone is an expert and three easy steps to fix everything. Mm -hmm. My work and my book is for people who are relatively safe. So when I talk mm -hmm. about being stuck, I'm not talking about being in an abusive environment or in a war torn country or like that is my disclaimer. When I talk yeah. about stuck, mm -hmm. I assume that you have relative safety and some choices. OK, so that said, I define being stuck as you know exactly what you're supposed to do. You know what mm. you want to, we all know what we're supposed to do. Drink the water, connect with friends, go to the gym, don't do drugs, you know. Yeah, eat, declutter your house. If you're listening declutter to this, you should house. declutter your house, yeah. <laughs> yes, that is a thing, people. Um, nevertheless, we're not, right? Mm. And so I hear this all the time. Why is the part of me knows exactly what I need to do to make my life better, but this other part of me takes over and mm. I'm not getting it done. It must be me, I must suck, I must be lazy. Yes. And no, you're stuck. You don't suck. And there's science to why you're stuck. And here's the solution that could help. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about motivation because this has probably been one of my favorite things I've heard you talk about is dismantling this idea that if I could just somehow find or manufacture or get up the motivation, that's clearly, Britt, that's what's missing in my life, right? Is just motivation. And if I had that, then every piece would fall into place. And so what are we misunderstanding about motivation? <sighs> the whole motivation word and I'm not anti-motivation for people who feel that motivation let's get up at five in the morning on a rainy day like go you I'm so happy that you feel it like good <laughs> for you like yay however for many of us myself included motivation is this fleeting feeling and sometimes it comes and sometimes it doesn't but the good news about the neuroscience is you don't need to feel motivated you don't need to feel anything to start to change everything. And that's really good news. Cause if I waited till I felt motivated, I'd still be on drugs, miserable, like alone and lonely and eating disordered and all of the things. So mm -hmm. you don't need to feel motivated to make changes. You need to take teeny tiny actions, not to feel like, yay, let's go do the thing. Yeah. So let's talk about those teeny tiny actions. So for the woman who's listening right now, my house is kind of a mess. I'm letting the kids watch too much TV just because I don't, I don't have the capacity right now to do something with them. What is that teeny tiny step that I could take today that would start to help me to feel a little bit better? 
Yeah. And this tool is both, it works. It works with everything from my house is cluttered and my kids are a mess to high level depression and mental health. Like it, it is, again, assuming you're relatively safe and you have choices, this will work. Everyone fights me on it, but I stand by it. DM me when it works because it will. I call <laughs> these micro yeses. Okay. Our brains, like people don't realize my, again, I didn't know. The human brain is not wired for happiness and health and productivity and our lives to work. Our brains are wired to keep us alive. Mm -hmm. And our brains hate big. The human mm -hmm. brain hates big, hates big anything, even if mm -hmm. it's like a good thing, anything yeah. big, our brains are going to go, uh-uh, that's not good. And so a micro yes is the smallest, it's smaller than a baby step. It's smaller than a small step. A micro yes is the tiniest thing that you can actually say yes to and then do. If you're not doing it, it's not small enough. So oh. for that woman who's listening, your micro yes might literally be pick up the spoon off the floor in the hallway. I don't know why it's there, but it's there. Pick up the spoon off the floor and put it in the sink. Hmm. But Britt, how am I supposed to get anything done? You have no idea how much stuff yes. I have on my plate and picking up the sticky spoon and putting it in the sink. But what about, and what about, and what about? Okay. Yes. But here's the thing. When you say yes, to anything, no matter how microscopic, that sets off a chain reaction in your brain. And mm -hmm. then your brain's going to want you to do it again. And now it's going to say, hey, do another one. Hey, do another one. And then eventually you pick up momentum. You don't need motivation. Mm -hmm. yes. You need momentum. Right. And you get momentum with micro yeses. I have friends, we'll text each other like, oh my God, I'm laying on my couch doing nothing, but I, you know, I threw my sneaker over by the door and tomorrow maybe I'll put it on and walk somewhere. And it's like, <laughs> yes, and then you celebrate those micro wins and then they yeah. build and that works. It yeah. works. It works. It works. That is so good. Well, you know, and I know uh, anxiety is huge right now. So let's talk a little bit about anxiety. Do you think feeling stuck and experiencing anxiety go together at all? They really do because anxiety will render you stuck. I know mm. when I'm overwhelmed and I, you know, I teach all this stuff, but I have to do mm. it also. Like I'm a recovering mm. train wreck of a human. I still go to therapy. <laughs> I still practice what I preach. I have to do this too. Uh -huh. When you're anxious, it sets off. It's sort of like hitting the emergency brake in your brain. And mm -hmm. then if your emergency breaks on, you're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then it's, well, why am I stuck? I shouldn't be stuck. What's wrong with me? But when we yell at ourselves, we're, we're pumping the brakes even harder. And mm -hmm. then we're pumping them even harder. And then we're really going nowhere. Okay. And so the fastest way to get out of an anxiety-induced stuckness yeah. is to start with, I am not lazy. My brain is on my side. My brain is braining and there are things I can do to help it brain better. Yeah. So w what things, if we're thinking about our environment or the way we're spending our time right now, what could help us to get out of some of these anxious patterns? You're not going to like this. Nobody does. And I say <laughs> this as someone who analyzes everything for a living. We don't want to start with why. Everyone mm. looks at their stuckness, their stress, yes. their stuff, and they all come to me and they say, but why? Why am I stuck? Why is this hard for me? I'm like, that's a great question. And your feelings about it matter. We don't want to start with why. I can sit on the floor in the middle of a completely cluttered living room and tell you why it's like that. But mm -hmm. guess what? That doesn't change anything. Okay. And yeah. so if you're in the middle of a burning building, you're not going to ask, why is this building on fire? It's like, get out of the building. We'll figure yeah. out why later. Okay. We don't want to start with why. Mm -hmm. Why? And everyone does this. But if I just understood why, then surely <laughs> I can make it. No. no, no, no. I understood why I did a lot of the things I did and I still did them. Yeah. It's not why, it's what am I willing to say yes to right now? Not tomorrow, mm. not January 1st, yeah. not next week. What am I willing to say yes to in the next 30 seconds? Find your way to a yes and throw the why on the shelf and we'll deal we'll deal with your why six miles down the road. We yeah. don't start with we don't start with why. Don't do it. I know yeah. you want to. Don't do it. <laughs> well, and that's so good because it is that thought of like, well, like you said, well, I could pick up one spoon today, but but what about tomorrow? And what about the next day? Because we all know like, well, it takes 21 days to make a habit. And we know that if I don't do this day after day and then, but when I'm picking up one spoon, then my toddler is putting two more spoons out there. And so it is, isn't it fascinating now that you're saying this, how we just get so caught up in, but, 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 and, but if we would just actually stand up and do the thing and help me remember, I know, um, sometimes when we're just caught up in those, like 
looping thoughts and it's just going over and over. That's one side of our brain. But if we'll actually stand up and like move our body, do a physical action, doesn't that help us to move over to a more logical or active side of our brain? Yeah. And it's so funny because all the neuroscience people get all like, the brain's not so simple that you can just divide it in this section. Does And I get that. But it's I like metaphors and it's a lot easier for me to think of my brain in terms of this part does this and this part does that. So I still use the metaphor. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but if there are neuroscience people listening, it's a metaphor. It's not literal. <laughs> so yes, when you're locked in that obsessive spiral of why mm-hmm. is this hard for me and what am I going to do? And it's so overwhelming that puts you in more of that stuck state but the Mm -hmm. second you say yes and take an action you've now switched into a different room of your house it's sort of like if we're sitting in your driveway talking about how messy your kitchen is we can talk about it all day but we're still sitting in the car in the driveway like we've Mm -hmm. got to get to the kitchen to -hmm. clean the kitchen and saying yes does that in your brain it takes you out of the part of your brain where you're spinning and puts you in the part of your brain where you can do the thing and then get the little dopamine reward right again and then do it again yeah no that's so good and i think we sometimes underestimate that we do actually get dopamine rewards from tidying up our space. Even like you said, just putting one spoon in the sink. It sounds silly when you're just thinking about it, but when you actually stand up and do it, you're like, wow, I just followed through with something that I I said I was going to do. And so I do understand how this, just these little micro things can build into more momentum. And so, you know, we've been hearing more and more about how we need people and we're, we're so isolated in the statistics. Everyone is so lonely. So is there a role for inviting someone else into this process with it? Or is it mostly trying to just create these micro wins on our own? Well, that's the nice thing about connection is micro connections get the job done. Like, Mm -hmm. yes, would a face to face for three hours over a nice healthy lunch with a friend where you hug each (laughs) like, yeah, that sounds fantastic. (laughs) And what fantasy world are you living in? Right. (laughs) But these micro connect at the beginning of the day, I'll tag I have a friend I text and like, all right, what's your what's your micro what's the teeny tiny thing mm. you're gonna do today? Yeah. And then it turns into a game. Yeah. And anytime we gamify the thing, yeah. we're gonna have more of that reward juice coming out. Mm-hmm. And that's the other thing about connecting with people on these micro yeses. It's not a bother. You're not asking Mm. someone for their time. You're not asking for a favor. These are micro connections as you're doing these micro wins. There's no lift on the relationship and it makes it so much more fun to share. Because here's the thing with micro yeses. You don't get the benefit if you beat yourself up after you oh yeah I threw the spoon in the sink but like there's two more on the floor and okay. the shoes. well okay mm-hmm. if you don't actually celebrate that little win mm-hmm. you negate the benefit of it you have to celebrate it so if you can find <laughs> someone to do it with create a micro yes email thread and then it becomes a, con- yeah. a contest like how many micro yeah. yeses can you get in today it's fun it's yes. it becomes a game and then we can yeah. win that's so good because I do like my mom will sometimes text me and she'll like send me a before picture of like underneath her kitchen sink. And she's like, I'm going in, you know, and then she'll text an update and, and then afterwards, and then we celebrate with her, like my sister and I on our little thread and we're like, wow, that was so awesome. And I was like, this is huge because I've often joked, like if a drawer gets decluttered and nobody sees it, like, did it really happen? Right. And I, we have isolated ourselves so much and we think, well, that's silly Brit. Like I'm not going to, you know, text my friend and say, oh, I decluttered the junk drawer today. But it's like, no, 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 no. This is actually exactly what we need to be doing. I mean, really, I mean, I, I sent someone a picture of my, I was super sick last week. And when I'm sick, everything gets cl- Everything just falls by the wayside. I will still take care of my, an- you know, my animals. So like I took my dog out and I took a picture of my dog pooping. I'm like, look, I took care of the dog. When <laughs> and it's like I've heard people say, well, like, why are you celebrating doing the adult things that you should be able to do as an adult mm. anyway? Yeah. And I'll push back on that all day long and say, if it was that easy to do, your job wouldn't exist, my job wouldn't yeah. exist, we wouldn't have social media feeds of all of this stuff. It's not easy, no. and we do get to celebrate it. And celebrating yeah. it shifts your again. It's neurological. Celebrating yeah. shifts your brain. Clean the junk drawer. Send the picture sure get the dopamine yeah well let's talk a little bit uh, about how our environment might play into a little bit how we're feeling and so you know i've ex- i'm not a professional like you in this area but i have experienced it in my own life that decluttering has helped me to feel 
less stressed, less anxious, more confidence in myself. I hear that from lots of women every single day. And so what do you think are, I, I, I want to separate this from putting pressure on anyone right now. Like now add this to your should list that you need to go de- declutter your house, but more I want to encourage and give permission to let go of things. So what has been your experience with our physical environment and, and how we're feeling? So when our brains are overloaded by worrying about our jobs, worrying about the kids, worrying about the economy, like all of these things. And if you watch the news, you're going to be pretty panicked as a general state all day Mm -hmm. long. Our brains were not designed to take in the amount of information that we pump into it. Mm -hmm. Having a cluttered room isn't just like, I want a Pinterest worthy home that's free of clutter. It's your brain will brain better when there aren't all of these objects and things around you interrupting it. Because even though I'm not conscious of my brain looking at everything, our brains have to work really, really hard where there's clutter, like Mm -hmm. to find the thing you're looking for or to do the thing you have to do. And I've told people, if you don't have the bandwidth to organize, even just shoving all the clutter underneath something until, I don't know if this goes against your prescription. No, no, it's true. Yeah. Go ahead. But you're yeah. better off shoving it into a corner and covering mm-hmm. it with a tarp. Yeah. Get to it when you can. Mm-hmm. But having a clear space does wonders neurologically and for your mental health. And if you can't clean it, fake it, shove it in a box, shove yeah. it in a bin, throw a blanket over it. But having all that stuff to look at is work for our brains yeah. and we need our brains to take care of these other things we're asking it to do. Yeah, I think that's so good. It, uh, it's um, well, because our brains are constantly indexing things around us, right? Looking for threats. And so our our brains really do have to work harder in a cluttered space. And I think, you know, we sometimes talk about like clutter blindness, blindness and we've become kind of immune to these things around us because we see it every day. But our brain actually is still looking for threats. It's still scanning it. It's still being like, oh, did I forget anything over there? Is any, you know, I mean, it's remarkable. And my hope is that, this is for is permission for anyone listening to say, hey, it's okay if you spent money on it. It's okay if you you know gave into an impulse buy late at night because your favorite Instagram influencer was promoting this. We totally understand how we all got here. It's never been easier to acquire stuff. But in this new year, let's prioritize getting our house simplified again because what a kindness it is to our brain and also to our family members' brain. I think about our kids and how they're neurologically developing right now. They thrive in highly simplified spaces. We live in such a noisy, chaotic world right now. What a gift to be able to come home to a simplified space. And a a, a thousand percent yes. And if you're listening and I I can hear the voice of people I work with being like, like you just said, great, one more thing. Now I have to feel Mm -hmm. shame every time I look at it. It's not about shame, but if you are overwhelmed and anxious and stressed and stuck, you don't have to look at your space and go, you know, wow, another item to my to-do list, but you can look at it and go, okay, well, it makes sense why I'm overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. You don't have to shame yourself, but definitely don't sit and ask why questions. And again, One spoon is the starting point of all the spoons. You know, one thing put away leads to the next. And I've told, I've actually sent people away who come to me for therapy when they describe their home. I'm like, you're actually better off taking the money that you would spend on this therapy session and hiring a professional organizer for an hour. It's not an indulgence. It is a wellness practice. Oh, Britt, I want to hug you right now. I have been trying to find mental health professionals that will validate this. And I'm like, you need to sub prescribe decluttering. Like literally yeah. it is just as effective as some of these other tools that you use as a therapist. I am, that makes my heart so happy that you just said that. <laughs> even more so. I, I have literally said to people, you don't like, if you're trying to allocate limited resources, don't come see me this month. They're like, but I really want to come talk to you. I'm, yeah. We can talk about your clutter, but you will feel better faster. You will be able to do more. I like, I like to think I'm good at what I do, but there's nothing I can do that's as powerful as decluttering a space. Yeah. So spend yeah. that money on an organizer or someone to help you clean because that is the best money you can spend on your mental health sometimes. Yeah, that is so, so good. And again, when we're thinking about like should and some of us actually have some really deep attachments to some of our things. And so 
again, it's it's not always just as easy as, well, just go home and declutter. And so I, I even love the idea that you're saying too, you might need to hire someone to come and help you, to talk through this with you. Or at a minimum, you might need to invite your friend or your neighbor into this. And many of us don't want to air our dirty laundry, our dirty you know, storage spaces and, and bedrooms. But if you could welcome somebody into this process with you who is safe and who you trust. So many of us can't actually declutter our house on our own because it's it goes too deep. Like some of these, and we know that it's not a rational connection we're having with this stuff, but we need to talk it out. We need to tell the story. We need someone else to help us understand why <laughs> we're hanging on to it, but also to give us permission to say, hey, it's okay to let this thing go. You're still going to be safe. You're still going to be whole without it. And in fact, you're actually even going to be better off without it. And even during the pandemic for people who couldn't hire someone because no one could go anywhere, yeah. I would spend sessions sitting on like a Zoom with people while they're cleaning and decluttering yeah. while I'm just carrying them on. And if you totally. have an attachment to your stuff, don't throw it away. Put it in a something and put that something where you don't have to see it. You don't have mm -hmm. to both clean and throw things out. I'm a throw things out per I have more mm -hmm. of an avoidant attachment. I'm like, I have nothing. I don't need anything. Throw it all away. Okay. <laughs> I'm married to someone who's like, keep everything. We might need it. And mm -hmm. so you don't have to declutter and throw away. I think some people get stuck because they think decluttering means I'm going to have to finally reckon with I'm mm -hmm. going to need to throw this stuff away. Take that off the table. Invest yeah. in big giant bins that you can put out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. Because it does, it, it is the best meant. And I say this as someone who takes medication, who goes to therapy and is licensed. Decluttering is sometimes the most powerful mental health practice that you can do. I'm so an advocate of what you do. <laughs> that is, oh, I might start crying right now. That is so validating. <laughs> and I appreciate that so much. I imagine too, when you were doing telehealth through the pandemic and stuff, you were seen into people's homes and it probably was a little bit discouraging to see some of the environments that, that people were living in. And how much shame there was about yes. it. I'm like, I'm your therapist. You mm -hmm. are paying me a lot of money to help you. And you're like trying to hide the corner that you're in. Yeah. And it's like, if you and apologizing to, I'm sorry, my house is such a mess. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is therapy. If, if you're apologizing to your therapist, like the likelihood that you're going to just call a friend is small, yeah. <laughs> but we have to, and again, I say this as someone with an incredibly shameful backstory. Mm -hmm telling on ourselves, whether mm -hmm. for me it was a meth habit or your kitchen is a disaster, yeah. telling on yourself is the first step towards truth. Mm -hmm. And Brene Brown talks about shame disappears in the face of empathy. Yeah. I know nobody that's not going to be empathetic to someone struggling with clutter. It is yes. not, a, if you're listening, it's not a you problem. I promise yeah. it's not just you. Yeah, that's so good. Well, let's talk a little bit about self self compassion then, because you're definitely um, tying into this. And so, it, I mean, it really is a cornerstone of personal growth, and it's also something that is completely foreign to many. Uh, for many growing up, it wasn't modeled to them, and it wasn't uh, something that was extended to them was compassion. I. I feel so now that I know more about this and I've seen what others have grown up with, I grew up in a household where my parents never shamed me. I never doubted for a second that I was loved. My brother and I were just talking about this. Like we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of stuff. Um, but we're like, wow, I thought every parent was loving and showed their child compassion and love. And so to learn later on in adult life that that was not the case, I have so much compassion for other people. And so if this was not modeled to us, if it was not acceptable for us to make mistakes when we were growing up, how, where do we even begin to, to cultivate this and to have this for ourselves? Yeah. And I love that you shared that because I'm like, wait, there are people who grew up with parents who like loved them well and made them feel secure. That is so like encouraging to know that that is out there. So the self-compassion thing is tricky, but let's, so let's start by defining it. A lot of people think self-compassion means I'm just going to indulge and give myself permission to do, say, eat, drink, whatever mm -hmm. I want. And it's not. Compassion is not a synonym for permission. Okay. Self-compassion is not self-permission. It's like, I'm just going to be compassionate on myself and buy everything and eat everything and drink everything and smoke everything. It's like, no, 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 no. Self-compassion is as simple as can you practice talking to yourself the way you would to a friend? None of us would speak to the people we care about with the same. I wouldn't speak to a, the Starbucks barista with the same type of just sharp, biting, critical, like mean, bullying tone that I sometimes used to use on myself. Mm -hmm. And so all self-compassion is, is be a friend to yourself. 
Yeah. It doesn't mean cosign on your behavior. It means get mm -hmm. curious about it. How would you treat a child who came to you and said, mom, I messed up. What do I do? If you're a loving, concerned, compassionate parent, yeah. you there sometimes are consequences. Sometimes you need to have discipline, but there's always love, understanding and problem solving yeah. together. Do we schedule reminders for ourselves? Do we put post-it notes around the house? I mean, like practically day in, day out, what does this look like to really retrain our brain in this way? Until it becomes a habit, I mean, I used to carry around a beanie baby and I would talk to it as, you know, I would not think the thoughts in my head. I would say them out because when you hear yourself say the words out loud, oh, my God, I'm being such an idiot again. Oh, yeah. wait a second. Out loud, it's easier to catch it than when it's just in your head. Okay. And so turn your self-talk into object talk. So I mm. carried that freaking beanie baby in my car. It was in my purse. I still have it. I did that for a year until I trained my brain to think about, wait a second, slow down. Cause our brains are wired to go on autopilot. Once something yeah. is a habit, mm -hmm. it's hard to break. Yes. So you have to do weird stuff that makes you feel stupid and uncomfortable. Yeah. Talking out loud feels weird and uncomfortable. It does work. It's like yeah. anything, you know, if you do it enough, it becomes second nature. I don't need to travel with my little beanie baby anymore, but having it everywhere I went did remind me, wait a second, there's a you here that you can be friends. You can be friends with your mind, wow. but it does take practice and everyone feels ridiculous when they do yeah. it at first. Like, this is awkward. I don't like this. I know, but it works. Yeah. But how did that change your life then though, when you were able to change your self-talk? So again, the self-talk, self-compassion thing isn't just about how we feel and like, just love yourself. There are really powerful things happening in your brain when you yell at yourself. Mm -hmm. So your brain doesn't distinguish you yelling at you and someone else yelling at you. That is a right. threat, right? Mm -hmm. So whether I'm yelling at me or you're yelling at me, uh-oh, that's threatening. When under threat, your brain is going to release a stress hormone called cortisol. And when that happens, that's when we end up getting into these states where we overindulge or we underfunction or we procrastinate or whatever, because our brains are trying to survive a threat. Like stop the cortisol flood by saying nicer things to yourself or encouraging mm. things. It's not just about your feelings. It's about yeah. your physiology. It's about your brain will brain better when you speak to it the way you would speak to another human being. Like it yeah. will be on your side more than if you threaten it. And then it acts as brains do when they're under threat. And then it's what's wrong with me. Nothing's yeah. wrong with you. Your brain's doing what it's supposed to do. Right. And I think too, especially for anyone who has kids, it's, we always become more aware of this then too. So I just even think about if we can start speaking out kindnesses to our kids and our family and to others around us and for them to witness that, then it sometimes helps us. If we can't even start with ourselves, sometimes to be able to start extending that to others. And then sometimes we slip up and extend that grace to ourselves without even realizing it. So I know for some women that has been helpful too, but there is so much importance on this because our kids are just watching what we're doing. And I, and I know that causes women a lot of stress when they feel like, well, great, not only am I screwed up now, but I've also passed this on to our kids. So what could you say to, to women? What could be one thing we could be really aware of here this week um, in regards to raising up kids that have the tools they need to be successful in life? And earlier in my career, I started as a play therapist. Mm. And so I, I don't have children. I'm child free by choice. So some parents are like, why are you telling me how to parent? I'm not. I'm telling you how your kid interprets things because I didn't have kids. So I had time to sit and stare at children all day and watch them and learn <laughs> their language. So kids don't need perfect parents. They really don't. What kids yeah. need and this is something doable right now is parents that will own when they make a mistake. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you say to yourself, you know, Oh my God, you're such an idiot. Oops. I just said something mean to myself. That wasn't good. Let's try that again. Oh, you made a mistake. Let me see about cleaning it up. And so you're not going to like spoil kids or soften them yeah. by saying, oops, you know what? Mom got that one wrong. And you must've felt really scared when mom yelled at you. Let's try that again. Because 
all parents are human. No humans are perfect. Mm -hmm. Kids, and I've seen this in, I've, and I've worked with some of the most extreme childhood trauma situations that you can imagine. I've worked in patient kids psych hospitals mm -hmm. and the case files are horrendous. Those kids, your kids, all the kids don't need perfection. They need parents who are willing to be human mm -hmm. and to show them what it means to be human, how to repair when we mess up, how to say, yeah. oh my gosh, I did that and you must have felt so sad when I did that. Let's find a better way. Oh my gosh. Like that's my dream. And it's such yeah. an achievable one because it doesn't yeah. require you to never mess up. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about friendships too, because I know, I mean, you look at the statistics, we've never been lonelier um, as a culture. Our kids are growing up to be lonely now as well. But I do think us having healthy friendships is also something that would be really helpful if we could model that to our kids. So where I, man, this, like I would say asking for a friend, but asking for myself, um, where do we even begin to make friends now as adult women? I didn't really figure out the friend thing till my late thirties. Like it didn't click. We're not taught how to do it. We're not mm -hmm. given a handbook. So we think as adults, well, as a kid, this is what friendship looked like. Yeah. So it should look the same way as an adult and it doesn't. So here's the thing with adult, especially with female friends, compatibility is so much more important. And we don't ever talk about mm -hmm. compatibility. I'll use yeah. myself. I am not a texter, phone call. Let's hang out all the time. Like that is not how I do friendship. Like my good inner circle friends are the same and they all know like when we're together, I am with you. I am ride or die. I am here, but like, no, I'm not going to go for coffee and then to the shower and then let's chit chat on the phone. That's not my thing. Mm -hmm. It's not that the other way is wrong, yeah. but even the most amazing women, if that's how they do friendship are not going to be compatible. And then we're going to be in a high conflict situation where they, <laughs> they're feeling ignored yeah. and abandoned. And I'm feeling like, oh my God, you're so needy. So we have to start with what type of, and I was never taught to ask this question and it's a really good starting place. What type of friends make sense for me? Mm -hmm. Not the type of friends I think I should have. Not the type yeah. of friends to saw. I don't need a, you don't need a bestie as an adult. You don't, that is not a thing that has to, if you have one, cool. But what type of friends make sense in my circle? Like, mm -hmm. what do I need? Do I need yeah. someone I can check in with every day? Do I want someone that will have dinner with me once a week? We have to start by almost like a movie cast list and describing the types mm -hmm. of roles yeah. and then looking at your people and going, am I trying to force this person into a starring role when they're more of a supporting character? Yeah. And if we don't know what kind of friends we want, how are we going to build that? That is so good. I mean, I would never even think about that of like, okay, well, what do I want in a friend and how available do I want them to be? How often would I get together? Mm -hmm. And okay, so if we can outline that and define that, then uh, where do we meet them? Where do we find them? How does this uh, come about then? So then once you have, and the what do I want in a friend is really the hardest part because once you get a sense of that, then you can start to look at yourself and go, all right, well, how's my, is my, am I doing anything? Am I going anywhere? Yeah. If my entire life is my kids, yeah. then your pool of friends is probably going to be limited to all of the other parents that mm -hmm. are shuttling to all the activities. And then you might need to change your parameters. Then it might be, I just want a buddy I can gossip about the whatever the pickup line with mm -hmm. and then sort of change things. But we want to know what's available to you. Someone who has 15 kids and all of the activities is going to have different options than sure. somebody with no kids. Mm -hmm. So before you go to, how do I meet my friends? It's what's available to you as far as mm -hmm. getting outside your bubble, yeah. because that's going to inform where are you going to meet your people? Yeah. But the thing is, everyone needs friends. Everyone needs friends right now. Mm -hmm. So whatever friend roles you're wanting to cast, like to cast, I guarantee you there are hundreds of other people like who want you to be in the same role True. for them. So there's totally. not a lack. There's yeah. not a lack. Yeah. Well, and let's talk a little bit about social media quick, because I think many of us have filled the friend void um, with influencers and other people that we follow online and our phones and Instagram. And so, I mean, do you have parameters that, that you think could help us to be a little healthier around social media? What are, what are you recommending in, in 2024 for social media and women? Yeah. And I'm a realist. I'm not saying turn off your social media. I, some of my best friends I've just met for the first time in the last couple of years because our friendship has existed on those digital squares. Yeah. So if you're going to use social media for your friend outlet, 
connect with them. Liking mm. an inf a mega influencer's post and getting really excited when they, you know, like something back, that's not really connection. Mm. But if you start to look at the people that are all commenting under your favorite influencer, you're going to start to see the same people. Mm -hmm. Send them a DM. It's the most low emotional risk way of connecting with people. It's like, hey, send, you know, you start by liking each other's stuff and then you send messages and then phone calls and Zooms and then eventually a group of us that I met online, we all went on an adventure travel together, which was so fun. Yeah. But digital friends count as friends if you're talking to them and okay. they are talking back. Yeah. Well, that's really encouraging. It then. is. Okay. So we don't have to just totally unsubscribe from everything. Uh -huh. Oh, just no. use it more interactively, not just mindlessly scrolling. Exactly. I, I love social media for uh, friendship opportunities that would have never been available, that yeah. weren't available for me earlier on. Yeah, it really is a great wa way to find like-minded people. I mean, I know so many in our decluttering group, like, I mean, they're jazzed about decluttering and they're like, no one around in my physical environment understands why I'm getting rid of all my stuff, right? But they can connect with people online who are in a similar season of life and it's been so fun. So I, I, I really appreciate you saying that, that that still counts, but we also do need people in our physical realm as well. And so let's talk just a little bit about self-care. I know all of these trends, I feel like it's like self-care is good. You have to prioritize and then like, no, you need soul care. And then you need, you know, and, and I think it sometimes leaves us like, huh, okay, I, I'm a woman, 40s. Like, what do I need for, for self-care day in, day out, week in, week, week out? It's tricky because often we don't even start to think about self-care till we're so fully burned out yeah. and a bubble bath and like a kale smoothie is not going to be the solution for burnout. So we can't use self-care practices as the solution. And th then we do them. Then it's, well, it's not working. Okay. You know, this is dumb. It's like, of course it's not working. You've been going a hundred miles an hour for 12 years. Yeah. And then you decide I'm going to try to take a bath. It's like, no, 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 no. So <laughs> I'm a big advocate of self-care, but self-care is going to look like different things on different days. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, for parents, it's helpful to know that you not doing self-care is not helping your kids. Yeah. Kids are not served by parents who are burning out and falling apart, even though they're still functioning and you can do all the things, but be empty. Knowing that self-care is not a luxury, it's put your own mask on first. And mm -hmm. if you have kids, your kids need to see you modeling self-care or they're going to learn that once they're an adult, they have to fully abandon themselves too. Yeah. And then asking yourself again, what are my choices for self-care today? It might be that the only self-care you get is to sit in your car in the driveway and listen to a song before you walk into the house and the disaster that's waiting for you. Mm -hmm. Great. That's what you do today. Mm -hmm. And so not what do I do for self-care? It's what's available to me in how big of a dose do I have two minutes free today or two hours? And then what are my choices? What are my choices is really the mantra for when you're stuck, when there's a self-care thing, with a friendship thing, with a parenting thing. What are my choices? Tease up a menu. And then yeah. once you have the menu, we can kind of micro yes our way through it. We always have to start with what are my options for self-care? I might want to mm -hmm. do a bath and a spa vacation and a weekend with my friends, but I don't have a tub or friends or <laughs> time. Yeah. So we have to adjust based yeah. on our choice points. Yeah, that's so good. And I was um, visiting with Michael Easter from Scarcity Brain and, and Comfort Crisis recently, and he was talking about how we need to get outside more, that we spend 95% of our time indoors. Do you see that uh, with the work you're doing too? Is there a factor of getting outside in all of this? Yeah, I have a really dear friend, Nicole Whiting, and she's a somatic coach and she's an ultra, she's one of those people that climbs the things and runs hundreds of miles <laughs> across the things. And she's incredible. And her, her go-to and her research is all about the benefits of being outside. And like, even mm -hmm. if you're outside for five minutes, like wh yeah. while I was sick, I called her. She's like, Brit you have to get outside. I'm sick. I don't want to get outside. She's like, I know. She's like, but micro, yes. I'm like, shut up with the micro. Yes. <laughs> She's like, okay, put on your hat, put on your coat. Like you need five minutes of fresh air. And mm. again, it's not an indulgence. It's our brains are not designed for screens and devices and yeah. plastic and metal. Our, our brains want fresh air and sunshine. Yeah. Uh, even rain, you know, plus yeah. when it's cold, your brain, deactivates its anxiety signals. So one of the fastest right. ways to work with an anxious system is to go outside when it's cold and let your body be cold. 
Oh, that's fascinating because yeah. a lot of us, you know, up here in Minnesota uh, are just like, oh, sorry, it's too cold out. Can't go outside today. But I've actually, my, my office is, is like a, I don't know, 100 foot stretch from our house. And I've been going out in just like a t-shirt. It's getting pretty cold here in Minnesota now. And it's, it's fascinating how I'm like, it makes me feel alive. Like you feel sensations that we don't feel in our 70 degree house all of the time. And then Tom's like, why don't, you're, you're modeling poor behavior to the kids. We're trying to get kids to wear coats outside and you're just like running around your t-shirt, you know? And I'm like, I know, but I'm like, it's just remarkable how I just like, I, I just feel like I'm feeling something, you know? And I'm it's like, so I've been, usually in the winter, I don't always get outside so much, but I'm like, okay, this winter, I feel like I need to be, I need to get whatever I need to get so I can be outside at times. And so I think that's so good. And the nice thing too, is it's generally free <laughs> for us. To yeah, if you live in a cold climate, you are, you're already set up for success, but it's not just you feeling alive. There are things happening in yeah. your brain and in your nervous system. Mm -hmm. So getting, I mean, safely, I'm not saying run yeah. around, you know, and get yourself yeah, sick, but being cold is one of the, cheapest and most widely available. And if you live in a hot climate, stick your head in the fridge or yeah. put your hands in a bowl of cold. I don't like ice plunges. Cold water doesn't, that's not my jam, <laughs> but the benefits of cold water, you don't need to mm -hmm. plunge your body in. You yeah. can put it on your face or put it okay. on your hands, put ice packs on your neck. You have no idea how many corporate Zoom meetings are happening with high level executives with ice packs shoved down their back and in their laps because they've spoken to me. And that's, that helps with stress and anxiety, wow. especially presenting, getting yeah. a cold sensation on your body. Really? That's mm -hmm. fascinating. I love that. Well, Britt, this has been so fun to get to visit with you today. I feel like I have learned so much <laughs> from our time together. So uh, we'll definitely look forward to, to catching up with you in the future. I know you're you're writing books, you're doing all kinds of things. So what's next for you? So the work, I wrote a workbook to go with the science of stuck because oh, cool. as much fun as it is to read, some people don't want to read a book. They just want yeah. the exercises and the workbooks. So the getting unstuck workbook will be out in June. I'm super excited. That's awesome. And definitely you'll want to follow Britt on Instagram and social media. I love your bite-sized pieces of information that you share on there. It's really encouraging. And man, you have so many great articles out too, psychology today and everything that you're doing. So great job. I mean, obviously, I love how you talk about, you know, being a train wreck in the past, but all the success you've experienced now, obviously, the things that you're doing and teaching are working. So it's been really fun to see all that you're doing. Thank you so much. I'm so glad our paths crossed. I yeah. love your work so much. I wish I knew about you 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think, yeah, all of us say that, like if I would have done this in the past, right? So right. But here we are and we can stick together. So I love that. So awesome. Thank you, Britt. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on the Minimal Mom Podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend who might find value in embracing a simplified life.